Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Board Game Barbecue Podcast. This is Jules here, and it is episode 265, brought to you by Advent Games and our wonderful Patreons. And today with me, it's um, Melbourne crew that are joining me. I've got Dan. How are you doing, Dan? I'm great, Jules. How are you? I'm I'm recovering slowly from PAX. It was oh, kind of mental. About it. And uh, I know that you guys dropped a, a, a PAX special episode during the week where you guys talked about all the fun you had, but uh, I was working. I might talk about that a little bit later. And I've also got Mike. Mike, how are you doing? Good, buddy. Good. I uh, picked up my voice from the PAX Loss and Found and uh, ready <laughs> <Yeah>. to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good thing. Um Look, obviously, if, just to, to get this out of the way, if you haven't heard already, um, Mike made an announcement a little while ago that he'll be leaving the podcast, sadly, and this will be his last episode here. Um, obviously, he's not disappearing from the community or anything like that. We'll see him at the next Melbourne game day and all that jazz. But uh, yeah, there's a, probably a bit to catch up on in that yeah. regard. <laughs> it's been a little while. So, Mike, I might give the, the floor to you for a bit and talk about the games you've been playing. Oh man, I uh, I've been playing a lot of games. It's um it's been pretty crazy. I've had a lot of good uh, game days uh, at my place and some friends' houses since I was last on, um, and I played a bunch. I had some friends come back from overseas and bring a bunch of games from Japan, and they got lots of quirky little games over there and some things that you can't get here, which is really nice. cool. Um, I've written a bit of a list of a few things. I won't mention too many. But I'll mention a few games that I've played recently that I've uh, really gotten into and got my hands on a couple. Um, the first one I'll mention is one that I played at PAX with our friend Greeny. Um, he sent me off to with a few of his friends to play a game called Capital Lux 2, which I'd never heard of before. Do you, either, either of you know this one? I know of the game. I just haven't played it. Yeah, it was really, really cool. They explained it to me like um, a board game is Blackjack, which yes. um, intrigued me a little bit. So, like... It was really interesting. The theme, I got no idea of. We didn't really go into the theme, and I don't really think it matters. But it was a cool game where, like, um, sort of blackjack rules where you don't want to go over a certain number. That number is based on, I think, four different colors or five different colors in the middle of the table, like different sections that you can play cards to. It's sort of like um, it's a mix between blackjack and multiplayer Lost Cities because oh. you have sort of a hand of cards and you can play a card into the middle to one of the colors. And what you're effectively doing there is if I play, you know, a four into pink, I'm raising that sort of blackjack number you don't want to bust over by four in pink. Um, or I can place it in front of myself, that, that pink four. And that's like my pink four going up against that middle pink four, trying not to go over it. Um, but when you play into the middle, each different color has a special ability. So one of them, when you play a card into that area, you can take the highest number from one of the other areas, I think. Um, one of them, my favorite one that really messes with everyone, if you play a color, I think it was into blue, a card into blue, uh, you can pick up one of these tokens that are face down. And I think there's six in total, maybe. And on the back of them, they have like minus one, minus three, minus four, or pluses. So you can look at it and say, okay, well, I just picked up a minus three. I'm going to secretly put that on top of the green area. So uh, people right. don't really know what the number is except for me, you know? Yes. Okay, cool. And during the game, everyone's sort of putting them down. And uh, our good mate, JB, kept saying, oh, that's a plus two. That's a plus two. And so we put one down. <laughs> it was always a plus two. Um, but this game just made you bite your nails the whole time because you're also incentivized to get as close to that number as you can, because that's one of the main ways you score. At the end of the round, once we reveal all the hidden information, if I was the highest person in pink, I get to take the highest number from that area, and I use that as scoring later. Um, if you do bust, if you happen to go over that middle number, you actually lose all the cards in that area. So there's a lot okay. of risk, and you sort of play over three rounds, and at the end of the game, uh, the per yeah, if you didn't bust any of the levels, you get to score everything. So all those cards you place down go towards your end game points. So you've got sort of, sort of some stowed away in the background, hopefully, that um, you got from previous rounds, and then you get to score all those cards as well. And it was just that really good, intense, like you don't know what's actually happening. you got some information, but not enough. You're trying to sort of screw everyone over a little bit. You're pushing your luck. It really sort of, you know, gave me that vibe of um, just a lot of fun, a lot of banter. I love my trash talking at the table. So that was really, really good. Um, so that was Capital Lux 2. 
Like, it comes in a big box version and a small box version. Oh, um, I didn't know my, that. Neither are easy to find. Uh, <laughs> but I've had I've had a mate lend me one so I can try to get a couple more plays in because I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I'll mention... So I've uh, just recently gotten two new Phil Walker hiding games that I'd never heard of before. And both mm. are like right up my alley. Uh, one of them is Monolith, which I'd never heard of before. So have we played Patchwork? Yeah. Imagine four player patchwork oh, wow. with 3D actual proper polyomino tiles and you're building an actual little like a square up basically. Oh, so they that's can, cool. you can be three high and I think three or four deep. Um but there's like multiple um there's there's usually like a tile in the middle like a card in the middle if you can make this your exact setup like one layer high all around and two layer high in the diagonals in between. If you can work out to do that, you get these bonus points or you can make a, um, a prediction. So uh, not a, a prophecy. So a prophecy, instead of taking your normal turn, you can take a token saying, I'm going to achieve this, you know? So you're sort of telling everyone else something that you're going towards and you attach it to one of the four sides of the, you got like a little board in front of you. Um, and it's got these little notches on each side. So you're sort of saying, now it's been a while since I played it, so I can't remember exactly what you're scoring, but I'm taking a five saying I'm going to have five scorable tiles on this side. Because as you look at your little board and you build up your monolith, you're scoring what you can see face on. So if I'm scoring blue and there's any orange in there, those are unscorable tiles from that side. I can only score the blue that I can see. And so as you play the game, it's patchwork style where you've got polyomino pieces all the way around. You move a little token. You can move it four spaces, take the piece you land on, or you can discard the piece to take a piece of the same color as a one cube to fill up little gaps. Um, but, mate, that was really, really fun. I'm like, how is this a Phil Walker Harding game, polyomino game that I've not heard of before? Yeah, that's, um, that's strange. It, it flew under the radar. Um, it, it's a bit on the expensive side. I think it retails for about 80 85 bucks. Yeah, but okay. you, you, you got these really cool, chunky, uh, different colored uh, monolith pieces, and they've got, like, you know, etchings in them and things. So it looks really, really impressive on the table. But that one was a lot of fun. Um, moving over to another Phil Walker Harding game. Uh, Explorers is another one I never heard of before, and it's not available in Australia. Um, it's basically the closest thing I can compare it to is like a big game version of um, Silver and Gold. So each player sort of gets these four map tiles. There's eight to choose from, but you randomize four of them, and the first player puts them into this little section on their board to make a big map in any sort of um, any way they like, then everyone copies that same board. So everyone's working off the same little map. But as you play the game, you're sort of um, flipping over cards, letting you know what sort of terrain you can walk on. There's all different terrains on the map. And you're sort of like exploring a map. So almost like Guild Dimension Explorers, wherever you sort of last went, you can sort of continue from there. And you're like trying to get a key to unlock a chest first to get more points. Or you're trying to collect different sorts of, um, I think there was uh, three different kinds of foods you can collect on there. And you're trying to get across the map in one round and collect all three for bonus points. There's all these different things you're sort of trying to do. And end game scoring goals. And like, yeah, you're just it's really, really fun. You're just... Um, have that sort of card coming out in the middle, letting everyone know what they can do. Uh, the main player can choose one of those actions, and everyone has to do. Everyone else has to do the, the opposite action. So most people are sort of taking the same sort of path, but you know, doing them in slightly different ways. And you're sort of watching everyone's map sort of grow as they do it. And it was really really fun. Like if you like silver and gold, you like that sort of polyomino flip and right sort of game. Explorers is sort of that next step up with a lot more intricacies going on with a lot more in-game scoring goals and things like that. Mm. Um, so yeah, Explorers was awesome. Um, and look, I'm not going to take up too much time today. I'm going to just mention one more thing that I've been really excited about. Um, I recently got a Kickstarter delivery from Allplay, previously board game tables. Yeah. Um, and they released four little games in that set. Uh, it was Chomp, Mindspace, Couture, and Sale. And I am so impressed with these games. They mm. are hot, hot, hot. I think everyone should buy the set. Um, the one that stands out from there that's a bit different to the rest is Sale. Sale's a two-player cooperative trick-taking game. 
Yeah, that's where... the one I loved the look of the artwork for, but it said yeah. co-op. I'm like, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> it was quite on. tricky. It was quite tricky. It, um, you're sort of both trying to follow each other's tricks in the best sort of way you can to traverse a boat without sort of crashing into um, obstacles okay. and trying to work your way from, away from the Kraken. And if the Kraken's attacking, you can play cards in a certain way to fight back. And it's sort of like just try not to die until you get to the end of the path. You know, so you need to try to get through this little um, run they have of different tiles that are set up. And we played the starter game when I played it. And so there's lots of different ways you can set it up. But when you get attacked, I think you lose health points, which sort of shorten the Kraken time from the time of your attacks. Mm-hmm. It's hard to explain. It's a really, really interesting game. Um, but that was really cool if you like your trick taking games and something cooperative. And once again, a two player cooperative trick taker are usually three words that's three mechanisms that don't go together usually. So it was really, really interesting to see. Um, Chomp is cool. Chomp is basically point salad with dinosaurs and sort of terrain. You're trying to set up these dinosaur cards in certain ways that. <clears throat> Uh, carnivore. So you've got carnivores and herbivores. You want to make sure that when you're making groups of them that they have a food source. Otherwise, the carnivores will eat the herbivores and you don't have to score them. Or, um, or you're trying to take... So you know you guys have play, played Point Salad, yeah? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. So you know you sort of take cards that are actually uh, like goals you're trying to do towards the end of the game. Mm-hmm. So you can take one of those instead of actually taking like a map tile for the dinosaurs. And it's very, very Point salad where you're sort of trying to build out your little dinosaur world and making sure all the dinosaurs are fed and they've got um, tar pits. If you put a tar pit adjacent to a dinosaur, it kills all the dinosaurs in that herd because you're trying to match up your herbivores all together in a big herd to score. But as soon as something kills one of them, they all die. So you're sort of constantly trying to move the tiles around and cover up tar pits and make sure that the carnivores are well and fed and trying to get all that going. Um, but Chomp is really cute and fun. Um, mind space. I'm going through a bunch of games here, guys. Got a bunch to talk about. I'm just trying to punch through them. If you have any questions, let me know to shut up for a second. Sure, man. Mind space is a roll and flip and write where it's polyomino. You're, you're trying to fill up your like a like a brain, and you're trying to fill it up with um all sort of different things that go on your brain, like um. Oh my God, I can't even remember now. I've gone through too many games at once. You're trying to fill in different sections of your brain with sort of, um, yeah, different areas that are represented in different colors. So you got like orange, blue, purple, green. Um, and what happens is you roll these four dice and the dice are numbered one to six as most dice are. You got a row of polyomino cards in front of you, six polyomino cards. And if you roll a one on a blue die, you put it in front of the first polyomino tile. If you roll a six, it goes to the end. And those are the colors you can draw their shapes in. So it's a game where you're sort of trying to choose which shapes you're going to draw where in your little brain. You want to cover different sections of the brain. The brain sectioned off into five different areas. So you want to make sure that you have, you know, blue in all the areas because when you have blue in all the areas, it gets rid of negative points or you want to draw green tiles because green gives you money that you can spend to do extra actions. Um, but the other kicker to that game is the same color can't touch the same color. So uh, you're really getting pushed in a corner as to yeah. where you can draw all the different things. Um, but there's like for such a small game, I had a whole heap of different scoring at the end of the game, which made it really interesting. Lots of, you know, choices on what you want to do there. Um, but that's probably been one of my favorites because I love my polyomino. I love my roll and writes. Um, so it really hit the spot for me. And I think it's a good roll and flip and write for a gamer as well because of the sort of uh, slightly more complex scoring in it, I think. Mm-hmm. It just gives you a lot of area to try to f- try different things in the game. I've played it like five times, I think, over packs. And each time I was trying a different sort of technique. you got three goals you're trying to work towards and trying to race to get them. So you're sort of trying different things in the game, trying to trying to race to those goals. Um, and that was Mindspace. And Couture is the last one I'll mention. Couture blew me away. And it was a really big surprise. It's a auctioning uh, sort of um, drafting game. That's uh, the theme is a fashion show in world fashion. And it's a game where you're bidding on three different cities at the same time. So you, in your hand, you start off with two cards and the two cards are sort of made to split up the different cities. You've got Tokyo, New York, and Paris. So on one card, it's half New York, half Paris. The other card is half Paris and half Tokyo. And the actual cards you're using to bid, 
you sort of slot into where you're bidding. So I'm going to put two on the far right for Tokyo, one in the middle for Paris, and I'm going to put a two in the left for New York. And everyone reveals at the same time. And then you try to work out who's got the highest bid in each area, and you draft one of three cards in each city. And there's set collection. There's trying to get the most um, of a certain icon. Uh, there's drafting more cards to add to your hand to incre- to better your bidding. Um, just a really unique unique take on those sort of mechanisms that worked really well together. I actually expected to like that the least, and it is one of my favorites. It's actually been a big hit with all my mates. It took everyone by surprise because the gameplay is really, really interesting. You're sort of watching everyone shuffle their cards around in their hand, and you're sort of trying to guess what they're doing. Also, the lower the number of a card that you're bidding on, uh, they have a tiebreaker on all the cards. It's like a little little thread, a little picture of a thread with a number attached to it. And the lowest number breaks ties. Mm. So in the game, you can actually draft a card that's a zero, a zero bidding card. It doesn't increase or decrease your bid at all. But it's got maybe a one or a two as a tiebreaker. So if you slide nice. that in to a bid that you think everyone's going towards, you, you easily break ties. Um, but that was a really unique game, really interesting. The art is beautiful. Actually, I'll say in all the games, the art is really unique and really interesting. Yeah, they all, all look stunning. Yeah, they're really small boxes as well. They're like, I don't know, 15 centimeters squared. So I carry around little game bags with me everywhere I go, and I can fit all four in one of them plus other games. And it's mm. such a really cool variety of games in this package they provided. Um, I got it on Kickstarter, so they all came with fancy little upgrades, you know, my, mind space instead of your colored die, the colored little brains with numbers on them. It looks mm-hmm. really cool. Um, but that's a lot of talking from me. Try to rapid fire through a few games I've been really excited to play lately. Just to run through them again, you got Capital Lux 2, Monolith, Explorers, and the all-play games Chomp, Mind Space, Couture, and Sail. And Breathe. There you go. Wow. Actually, while, while you were talking um, just about those last all-play ones, I went... Because Monolith, I was like, I'm sure I've heard of this. I looked it up. As soon as I saw the cover, I recognized it. I just didn't realize it was a Phil Walker Harding game. Yeah. Um, which he published through Simon. And before we started recording this, um, you mentioned something that uh, you discovered at PAX that Phil mentioned was pretty exciting. Oh, my God. <laughs> I don't know how this isn't headline news on BGG. So I went to a awesome panel that was um, Phil Walker Harding and Matt Dunstan, where they spoke about, um, you know, their history. They sort of interviewed each other, which is really fun to see. They've grown up in this industry together and it was really cool to see the banter they had and and the, their experiences and they were sharing play tests and all sorts of stuff. But um, I think somebody asked a question that led to this about like maybe a mechanism they might have wanted to include in a game that they've never quite gotten right and haven't been able to include in a game. And Phil went on to talk about he's been trying to get a certain, certain mechanism in a game, I think, for like 12 years, and he hasn't been able to crack it. He's got this cool idea. He wouldn't mention what it was, but he hasn't been able to crack it. And they're sort of talking about how that's what's really good about collaborating with other designers because they can um, exchange ideas, help each other solve problems, and he approached another designer to help him crack this problem. And they've cracked it and they're going to make a game together. And so everyone leant forward in their seats, like, who, who are you making a game with? And the least expected thing came out of his mouth. Eric Lang, Phil so Walker crazy. Harding <laughs> and Eric Lang are going to make a game together. And I hope it's another Zombicide, really. Like, <laughs> let's, 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 I, I'm just, I, I've got my wallet in my hand, ready to throw at them both. Like, just take my money. And give it to me. So I am so excited. Yeah. No, I I don't know what those two are going to make together, but hey, I'm excited for it. That's for sure. Uh, cool. Um, Dan, you've got a few games you've listed here that I'm interested in hearing about because I don't know much about them. Well, the first one I was I was going to um, mention was we uh, the the game barbecue library you got a copy of mysterium kids now i was a big fan of of, of mysterium i actually yes. moved, moved it on from my collection because it was just hard to get to the table um but i used I was, to play it a lot yeah i was super curious to how mysterium kids was going to work and it wasn't at all what i thought it was going to be oh okay <laughs> it's 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 kind of ridiculous but at the same time, it's ridiculously fun. So I like ridiculous. I played this with my boys and my wife and my mum. So okay. the boys, the boys played, got to play with their grand. But 
it's uh, the, the premise is that you are going into a haunted house to try and find this ghost treasure and similar to Mysterium, you each take or, sorry the Mysterium, there's one ghost isn't there well in this case this one you're actually taking turns being, oh, being okay. the ghost and there are five um cards there's actually like just objects or some of them are actions but they're placed face up in the five different rooms and when you're the ghost you the oh, uncle joe or something his name is and you shuffle the the um the tokens you flip one over and it's a number between one and five and so that's the that denotes the object though the card that you have to try and communicate to the rest of the team they work together but the way you communicate it is with a bloody tambourine what <laughs> So uh, that's and, funny. <laughs> and so and that's what I said. That's the ridiculous part. <laughs> so you either hit it or scrape it or sort of make little noises on it. You can do whatever you want, but obviously Wait, you can't speak. How big is this tambourine? It's kind of, I don't know, it's about the size of a small saucer, like a small plate. Yeah, okay. Um, and it's got the you know the drum skin on it. it doesn't have yeah. like um, it doesn't have bells or anything on it. Okay, oh, okay. So it's kind of hitting it like a drum or scraping or tapping or doing whatever. The problem is that a lot of the cards, well, a lot of the cards that were popping up when we were using it. One is like a hammer. Then yeah. one is like thunder, and then one is like, <laughs> or, or one is like a snake, and then one is um, someone wiping their shoes on a doormat, and the other one is an hourglass. Oh, wow. And so, wow. how on earth do you make the noise that's dis- distinct enough that you, that they can they can peg which uh, which number from one to five it is? So there's a and so the most of the fun is a the ghost gets to make the noise, and then the other four we, we played at max five, but are all debating on what the object is. And so, can oh, they repeat oh, making the noise over and over? Yeah, and, and you have to and you have to be careful about not being too charadesy at the same time imagine yes. when you're making the sound yeah so what supposed, everyone's supposed to close their eyes so they're focusing on the sound oh the wow ghost, okay and then the ghost says boo makes the noise and then says boo again to do when they're done when you're starting and when you're when you're finished oh that's so cool and then it's gonna be better when the deluxe out. kickstarter comes out with a full drum kit <laughs> so you can really get the range of sounds <laughs> So like, it was ridiculous, but at the same time, it was just ridiculously fun. The kids really enjoyed it. So that's the main thing. The, the, the rest of us were just rolling our eyes at each other going, really? This is, this is dumb. But the boys thought it was hilarious. So, and they I, wanted to, they wanted I to reckon play. that would be a great game with a bunch of adults <laughs> at the pub. Oh, that yeah. would be hilarious. Um, so yeah, that was, that was the, um, the other games that I played. I've already mentioned them, mentioned most of them at, on our, on our pack special. So I don't want to sort of, um, repeat myself and I'm happy to save my save my sizzle um yeah if you want but yeah cool I'll mention a few games I've played um it's uh, actually before I launch into that I I didn't get to talk about much on the PAX uh, episode because I was working at PAX and it was a very different experience and I didn't realize until a couple of days after coming home from PAX I didn't actually play any games at PAX. Wow. <laughs> Which blew my mind, but at the same time, I was so busy. I was working. I taught a lot of games, but I didn't play a lot of any games at all. Um, but it was still such a fantastic experience, and it was so fun seeing people and, and, and chatting and catching up and uh, all these people buying new exciting games, which was really, really fun to see. Um. So, what I have been able to play, though, before I went to PAX, uh, and a little bit after, actually, Mitch taught me Great Western Trail New Zealand. Oh, cool. Now, this is my first foray into the Great Western Trail. I haven't played any of them mm. before this. So, I've jumped into the, the latest version, and I really enjoyed it. I was quite surprised. I, I kind of, as we were setting up the board and, and seeing all the bits, I was kind of like, eh, this looks like a very typical Euro. Go th- mm. go there, get a thing. That thing converts into another thing. And it didn't really, it didn't inspire me seeing it up set up on the table. But as I got more into it and started understanding the game and the deck building elements in it, I started to really, really enjoy it. And it obviously, I can't really compare it to the original, but Mitch was saying it has a lot more bits added on to this that the original doesn't have. But, yeah, I I thought it was a fantastic game. I don't know if I'll want to go and try the original now that I've tried this 
simply because the original might seem too simple and basic. Uh, but we'll see if time will tell with that one. But really enjoyed Great Western Trail New Zealand. I'd th- absolutely play that again. Another one I played uh, just before PAX was Surf's Up. Oh, yeah. So, I, I this is obviously local designer Jay and uh, he was there at PAX, but I got to play it before PAX started. And I I loved it. I thought mm-hmm. it was so good. Just And the, the, the final version that's starting to come together, it hasn't had an official print run yet, although Jay got to sell... Uh, a different version of copies that was printed for him winning the award last year Mm. uh, at PAX. And so he was able to sell those, which was really cool. But Good Games Publishing will be, you know, doing a a new print run, which will have uh, a neoprene mat, which of course matches. Yeah, it will match with the wetsuit. So, you know, it all goes together. I wanted to say I bought a copy of um, Surf's Up from from Jay and he was so nervous he didn't know because I asked him to sign it. And he, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, oh, I'll just sign it on the back or I'll sign it inside. I'm like, no, no, I want it right on the front of the box. That's it. Oh, no, I don't know how I feel about that. (laughs) And he he loosened up. He wrote, you know, to Dan, um, stoked for your support or something. And then he got carried away and started drawing sunglasses on the seagulls. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) I've got a great copy of Surf's Up. Yeah, uh, I, I, I told you that was my first game I wanted to buy at PAX because yes. I, I was demoing it in Sydney for him and I've loved every game I've played of it. And it's such a good little game. And I'm like, that, mm-hmm. I want to make sure I get one of the OG copies. Yeah, absolutely. That that will be a nice collector's item because that version won't ever be printed again. Yeah. It was just a one-off. So that's really cool. But yeah, Surf's Up is a very simple game where you're bidding to catch waves and whoever plays the highest number gets to catch that wave. And... Whoever they'll get first pick of some items on the beach, and whoever has the second highest will also get items off the beach. And when you use the card, if you win a wave, it's burnt, it's out of your deck for the whole game. But if you lose the wave, it goes into a discard pile, and you can collect those back by playing a zero, which means you, you sort of tap out for catching the wave. But then it's got wrinkles in the game, like the uh, the jellyfish, mm. where you're trying not to catch the wave. And so whoever plays the lowest number is the one that gets stung by the jellyfish. It's it's just a really simple game, has nice thematic ties, but it creates some great tension. I, I can't wait to get a copy of this. It's a, it's an absolute win for me. It's a great game. Mm. Yeah, it's so good. And the last one before I launch into a sizzle at some point would be I played for the very first time a classic it's been around a long time and it recently started delivering. Oh, recently? Yeah, somewhat recently, this year at least. Uh, the a big deluxe version of it that Awaken Realms produced. That's the Castles of Burgundy. Oh. Ooh. Yeah. So, I'd never played it before, but I'm assuming both of you have played it before. Yeah. No, I've only just started recently playing it on BGA and ah. really just muddling my way through it, trying to trying to work it out. Okay, cool. Well, I I was really charmed by this. It's very simple to learn. You roll two dice and you get to take two actions. You can buy, um, you can take locations from whatever number dice you use. It's like a little rondelle, but, you know, pieces don't move around. It's just different markets. And then you've got uh, locations on your player board where you can put those locations you've collected, again, having to match uh, the die that you're using. And then all all these different places you collect have different powers and you're trying to just sort of combo them together to sell goods or reactivate tile powers again. And that's really all there is to it. It's very, very simple, but it's kind of addictive where you start to line things up and go, oh, I'll collect that tile. And if I put that in my reserve and then build this in the next round, I can build that and that will trigger that again. And I get this thing. It's it's really, really good. I, I really enjoyed it. And unfortunately, because I only played the uh, deluxe copy and I've experienced the best version <laughs> in terms of production value, but I don't know if I want to go pick up an old... <laughs> Yeah. OG version. Now tell us about these sweet, sweet deluxe components. Uh, so, the version I played with, we used the um, the acrylic tiles. So, there was an option, I think, you could buy miniatures for all the locations. I've heard they're quite impractical, though, but the 
the acrylic tile version is just fantastic. That would be the way to go. And you just put castles, the actual castles you build on your board, we use the miniatures for those because oh, wow. there's no particular powers for those. They just give you another turn. But, man, yeah, really good. Happily play that anytime. There's dozens of boards to have different setups when you play and they're all double-sided. Just a really nice production. Very, very easy to learn and really, really enjoyed that one. That's the Castles of Burgundy. Nice. All right. I might throw to Dan for his sizzle because I there's a lot of hype mm. about this. This is a game we're wow. selling at PAX. And I got to also play it for the first time this afternoon. But I'll hand it to Dan. Hey, Dan he's going to steal my thunder. He's going to be the captain here. I'll be the co-captain and away oh, we go. I see what you did there, Jules. <laughs> You've given it away. My <laughs> sister is going to be Sky Team. <laughs> um, I've been looking forward to this one for a long time. I, um, I'm a big fan of Scorpion Mask and everything they do from um, zombie kids, zombie teens, uh, to crypto, Scorpion Mask as well. So when they said they were bringing out a two-player um, cooperative game, um, I, I was in. And then... Someone told me on the weekend, oh, it's, uh, it's, it's okay. It's just like falling, uh, under falling skies for two people. And I'm like, well, then I'm definitely in. <laughs> That's, you've just completely sold me on it. That's not a bad thing at all. <laughs> it's like someone telling me that um, Star, uh, Starfield is just like, oh, it's just like Skyrim, but it's in space. I'm like, yeah, that's great. <laughs> anyway, we can talk about Bethesda games later. Um, so, yeah, S- uh, Sky Team is a two-player game where you actually – you sit side by side pilot and co-pilot and you have a little um a little cover where you roll four dice in but then in between you is your console and what you're trying to do is over a series of turns you're trying to land a plane in at an airport and there's so many different variable uh series of different um different airports that come with the game and you've got i think it's a series of um i think it's seven rounds to try and land the plane and while you're doing that on your turn you're you're rolling your dice and then you're allocating them to various points on this control panel the first and and the pilot and the co-pilot for the most part have separate separate places to, to um to place their dice the first one is your the axis of the plane itself so you each have to place a number on either side of the axis and you're trying to keep the plane level. You can actually have the plane slightly leaning to one side or the other. In fact, there are some um, some levels or some uh, airports where you are required to, at a certain point, be leaning to the left a little bit or leaning to the right as if you know, that's your flight path and you know, when you come into Tullamarine, you have to use the south runway and so you've got to mm-hmm. sort of turn a little bit. But when it comes time to actually the last round when you're landing the plane, you must be dead level. And the way you do that is by each placing a dice on either side and the dice must be the same. That way the plane stays level. If the dice on either side is, slightly, is, is higher by one pip or by two numbers, then the, the plane will tilt one or two degrees. If it tilts three three degrees, the plane will actually crash. Oh, so wow. you're jugg- you're juggling that b- b- between the two of you over the course of nine thousand feet, eight thousand feet, seven thousand feet. It's okay to be slightly off kilter, as long as you can correct it on the next round and make sure you're dead level when it comes into land. You're also trying to manage your speed. So again, you're both placing a dice on either side of the speed um, of the speed marker, and the the the, the um, the total of those two dice must be within the the speed range, and I think it starts off between five and five and nine, or possibly four and nine. Yeah, and I think so, it's four and nine. Yeah, and so you you're, you're working together. I say working together, but you're not, you're not allowed to speak during turns, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, um, so to make sure, now there's there's also the co-pilot who sits on the right hand side is responsible for for the flaps. There are four different spots where the, I think, sorry, five different spots where there are these little switches where they have to place a dice up a one and a two to activate that one, a two and a three, a three and a four, a four and a five, five and a six. And all the flaps, by the time that the plane comes into land, all the flaps must be down. The pilot also has um, three switches on his side, on their, on their side, I should say, which are the landing gear. You, where you place a one or a two and you drop one landing gear, a three and a four, another landing gear and a five and a six. But when you're dropping your landing gear and your flaps, you also change, that also affects the range in where your speed sits. So Jules and I said that it starts at four and nine, but then if you drop one of the, the flaps, then it becomes four and 10. Then it becomes four and 11. So your speed has to sort of match what, mm. what your plane's doing. But then if you start dropping your landing gear, then it becomes five and nine, five and 10. So you've got to try and juggle that. You can't really just go, right, 
let's just take care of all the flaps and landing gears right now because then that completely mucks around with where your speed range is going to be. And when you when you when you lock in your speed, then the um, the airport track which sits above your um, your console it slides in slightly, so you're getting closer and closer. And if you get the if you your speed matches perfectly with those two gauges, it just moves one spot. If it exceeds then you're accelerating, and so it moves two spots. But sometimes on this this track, on this airport track, you've got planes in the way. So you cool. don't want to actually accelerate and move this track closer and closer. What you have to do is radio ahead. So each of you have an opportunity to place a dice and radio ahead, and the number you put on, the, on that spot denotes how many spaces ahead down that track you get to clear some planes. So sometimes there'll be no planes. Sometimes there'll be a couple of planes along the way. Sometimes there are some... Uh, levels, shall we say, or some airports that require you to roll a dice and add more planes as you're going. And then there's sometimes there's other planes that are sitting on the runway when you get to the airport. So not only do you have to be level when you um, when you land, or not only do you have to have your flaps and your um, your landing gear, landing gear down, but you've got to make sure there's no, air, no no other planes on the runway when you get there as well. So it is it, wow. it is so 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 good. There is an opportunity to mitigate the dice roll sometimes. So there's these things, these little coffee cup symbols. So if you have a spare dice or you want to maybe use a dice on something other than um, what I've just mentioned, you can put a dice down the bottom and you get a coffee cup. And the coffee cup is basically allowing you to concentrate because I'm assuming pilots just get deeply caffeinated when they're flying planes. Mm. And then that allows you to change the pip of a dice up by one or down by one, which going into the final few rounds, it's really good to have some coffee cups available to you because then there's because there's no room for error. And I say that because you're allowed to talk about what the plan is at the start of the round, but once you each roll the dice, that's it. You're not allowed to communicate with each other anymore. And so um, the, the turns alternate depending on how far you are out from the airport or what your elevation is, I should say. Um, so the co-pilot might start the next time the pilot will start so you're kind of following their lead and trying to trying to be as generous as you can to certain decisions so like to for the for the axis you know that the the, the co-pilot needs to trying to find a number that's very close so putting a three or a four gives them a lot of wiggle room to maybe go one up or one down or match or match same as with the speed you know you got a range between five and nine so playing something like a four gives them an opportunity to play a one, two, three, or four. You don't want to play a six because then you're really limiting the dice that they can play in order to be able to match that speed. Um, it's great fun. I played it uh, three or four times with Adrian while he was down here from PAX. Played it with my wife a couple of times this weekend as well. We vowed to actually go through the, um, it's called the Flight Log, and there are a series. Of, so the game itself comes with, um, I want to say it's about maybe 15 different airports or with varying mm-hmm. degrees of difficulty. Some of the airports are really short. So you need to sort of almost, you need to under, when it comes to speed, you need to play numbers that are under that sweet spot. So you don't actually progress. Some of them are longer than the airport. So that forces you to actually play some larger numbers and accelerate. Some of them are full of planes. So you're <laughs> trying, to, trying to radio ahead and manage and get rid of all these airplanes that are in your in your direct flight path before you actually get to the airport. And then some of them have a heap of other different features as well. So it might be just a straight, um, a simple, just a runway and a simple uh, airport in the path or whatever. But there's other components that you add to your control board. There's a great one, um, which is a, a, the, the fuel gauge. So you're actually trying to manage your fuel as you go as well. There's also an op- there's also one module where you start losing fuel. Oh wow! So the diff so the the um the difference in your um in your speed. So you're trying let's say your speed is ten. If you one of you plays a six and one of you plays a four, the difference of that is two. You add one to that, so it's three, and then you lose three. You lose three fuel. Oh. So if the, if you're trying to get say eight, for instance, you don't want to play a six and a two because that is actually a difference of four, plus one makes five. You lose five fuel that turn, and there's only 20 fuel on the gauge. Oh. Like a race against the clock sort of thing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So you're literally trying to manage an, an, an additional thing. The other, um, just, just the straight fuel gauge without the leaking fuel module, if you're just playing the straight fuel gauge, there is a, a spot in the, um, to place a die at the top of the fuel gauge, and whatever die you actually place there, that's how much you actually decrease the die, d- decrease the fuel. If you don't place a dice there, you lose six fuel. 
Oh. You can set again. There's, okay. <laughs> so you have to. So that's one more spot where you have to allocate a dice, and there's not enough spots on the on the board to allocate the dice, particularly if you're not communicating with each other verbally as well. So it is super super fun. I'm, I'm interested. What was your experience with it, Jules? So I've just played the beginning mission, um, yeah. and we managed to get a successful landing. My my partner and I, and yeah, it's it's <laughs> we you know it it was sort of because communicating before you roll the dice is like all right we sort of need to focus on this area and but it was just so funny going through the rounds our plane just is going left <laughs> to right to left to right. we couldn't quite get it level for most of the runway um leading into the runway but we managed to stabilize it and having that extra coffee just meant you could get it bang on but <laughs> it's it's so clever because it just feels like you, you've got to just time everything perfectly. It has to be like clockwork. You want to start getting that landing gear going as you're going through, but don't slam it all down at once because it makes it harder. And I, I think what I really, really enjoyed was just it, it felt like the pressure was just always there. It wasn't. It wasn't. It didn't feel super punishing. Although I know that for newer the other airports you play will probably feel like that, like threading a needle. But um, it was just, it just felt like there was enough pressure there that you really had to be managing all the things. And it just, uh, it it tied together so well. It was so thematic. I I really thoroughly enjoyed this. And I'm keen to actually play some of the solo solo modes. Uh, I don't know if all the airports have a solo mode or not, but I think- I wasn't even aware of the solo mode. I'm pretty sure I read, I could- could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I read in that flight log book there were some that had like little symbols for one or two player. I could be wrong, but okay. Um, I- either way, it's such a great game. Really, really enjoyed it. I had two questions. The first one is more to Dan. How many plane puns did you make during this game? <laughs> oh, those puns, they came to me quite plainly. Ah, uh, yeah, I thought so. I thought so. <laughs> the, the real question was, how long does this game go for? Is it like quite a quick game? Is it yeah, a bit longer? Like 15, 15 minutes. minutes. Yeah, that's awesome. Yep, yep, yep. There is actually one module or one, um, I suppose they're not really called modules. Are this like a, a, a different, um, a bit, um, I don't know how much looking at the book now, and actually they are actually modules. But one of them is is a real-time one where you, you start, you have to yes. start and you literally get 60 seconds to play oh, out wow. the round. That's yeah. cool. That's that the, that, that would be stressful. Play that level. <laughs> so it goes. There's the book itself is kind of like a um, at the back of the flight the, the flight log. It's got all the different. There's one that's wind. There's one that's ice breaks. Um, there's the real time. There's, oh, there's I mentioned the traffic die. There's certain airports that will have a little die, a black die, and when you hit that marker, you roll the dice and you add another plane on onto yeah. the field. So there's six different easies. There's seven hard. There's oh, sorry, seven medium. There's five harder. And then there's three that are ridiculously hard. Um, so there's heaps, heaps of gameplay. I think what I also really enjoyed about it is the fact that it does, like I mentioned, feel like you're threading the needle. There's so many ways to lose. Like yeah. you mentioned earlier, you could tilt your plane too far and it goes into a barrel roll or you overshoot the runway or you crash land before you get to the runway because you haven't timed that descent, your speed correctly or just colliding with another plane. Like, yeah. And just ah, oh, the the timing elements are so clever. They've yeah, absolutely but, knocked it out of the park. Yeah, it's great. Adrian, I'm playing on, on one instance where the um the two tracks above you that slide that tuck underneath the control panel. Ideally, you need them to. They might start off yes, um, off kilter. You need to actually make sure they come into the that they tuck into the top of the control panel at exactly the same time. So that mm-hmm. at the time your final round is landing, you're also already at the you're at the airport ready to land. And so there was one instance where we had to. Just just through the the poor dice, we actually had to um, our speed was less than what it needed to be in terms of that gauge, so we didn't actually get to advance one of the tracks. So then the next time we had to make sure that we exceeded that range to accelerate, yes, catch up, we actually drop by two, but we couldn't do that because there were planes in the way. Oh, and now yeah. we're trying to get, clear those planes out of the way, knowing that as soon as we do, it's going to drop by two. And so we're going to get twice as close to to the airport, and yeah, just little little nuances like that. It's just so clever. Yeah, really, really clever game. So, yeah, I highly, highly recommend it if anyone's looking for a really good two-player game that it's it's simple in theory, but then there's some different modules and things that can can, can mix it up. And it's kind of nice playing next to somebody instead of playing across the table from someone mm. as well. It's, it's really good. Yeah, enjoy that. 
Cool. Well, that's Sky Team. Um, Mike, do you want to talk about your season game? Because funnily enough, I have also played that this week and <laughs> love it to bits. I um I thought for my last episode in the barbecue, I should definitely go out with what I do best and talk about a new small push your luck game that I've had my eye on for a long, long time because the theme is right up my alley. The sort of game it is <clears throat> is perfect for me. And uh, the game is Spots. Um, it's a board game about putting spots on dogs. And yep, that could have been cuter. <laughs> like I think the first two pages, it says... Dogs have spots, dice have spots, put dots, put spots on dogs. Like, yeah. <laughs> and that's what the game is. Yeah. It's, um, you're trying to make a pack of six dogs. The first person to complete six dogs and score them all is the winner. Um, <clears throat> and it's just such a cute game. The artwork is really, really cheeky at times. It's yes. very, very cute. Each dog, of course, has a name. And I told Renata, I said, as soon as you see this game, I can just see you just yelling out each dog's name. And, <laughs> oh, my God, it's Maribel. Oh, my God, it's Maribel. And she just absolutely swooned over it. And it's such a fun little game. Before I get into the gameplay, one little touch I think is really good. It looks like someone's taken a, a marker and like darkened the areas around all the pips on the die. Like, so they look like dog spots. It's not yes. just normal pips on the die. No. They're just a bit more dog spotty, which I think was really, really cute. But basically the die, the, the box comes with a whole bunch of dice, little white dice. Um, you start with two dogs and yeah, you sort of want to do tricks. There's six tiles at the start of the game and four of the tiles can be changed as a whole batch of them in the box um but basically in your turn you're going to do a trick that trick is going to let you usually roll some dice in a certain manner um and your dogs all have little dice placement spots on them so some dogs are a bit easier some dogs are a bit harder um but they have you know little little dice drawn on them that you want to fill in the spots there's one dog that i think everyone loves it's got just a number one run its butt that's yeah, that's, it needs. I, I was going to mention that's what that. Everyone loves that little guy. Everyone <laughs> the, loves that dog. That dog's name is Bert. <laughs> yeah, you got to love Bert. The the Bert's the best. One dot right on that uh, the butthole on the freckle, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and so it's all well and good. You want to put your you know your your dice on the dogs and fill in the spots, but you if you're forced to take a die that you don't have a spot for you got to bury it in your yard and everyone gets a little little yard card and the yard is sort of where you bust so if you can't play a die and you have to put it into your into your yard if you exceed seven pips on die you bust and when you bust all your die from the that are buried go back into the pile as well as any dice you placed on dogs now i did mention you start the game with two dogs one of the tricks you can do is to draw a new dog and add it to your packs so and now you have three dogs to fill in <clears throat> and uh and roll one die you know but there's other things like um there's two that's one of the cards that, that that's uh, i think it's uh called howl when you bring a new dog in as long as you don't have more than six cards uh, there's also roll over that's in every game where you can take all the dice from your buried section and re-roll those dice. So, you know, I've got I've got three twos in my area. I'm going to bust soon. That's three dice I can roll. I'm going to re-roll all those dice and hopefully be able to use them. And any ones that I can't use go back into my buried area. Um, you collect uh, dog treats in the game, little red bones that are really cute. And you can spend those bones to re-roll all the dice you just rolled. And they've used that in an interesting way because... Um, some of the some of the cards, like one of the ones I like in the base setup, it's roll three die and then you place them all. And then you may roll one more die. And it says you can repeat this action as many times as you like. So because you're rolling one die, if it's a bad die, you can spend your bone just to roll that one die again instead of the first three that you initially rolled. Um, but it's got stuff like, um, this is again on the starter pack, you can roll eight die at once pick one of the numbers and then take all the number. So if I rolled three twos and I pick two, I take all three. Hopefully I can place them all on my dogs. Otherwise the rest go into the, into the junkyard, into the berry area. Um, but you can, yeah, you can change around these little cards. There's one that I'm hanging to play. I like games with a bit of meanness in it, as long as you're playing with the right people. One of the cards. So, um, let me reverse a bit. Some of the dogs have paws on them, like a little paw symbol. And that might be relate to, uh, you know, take a treat and they take one treat for each dog with a paw on it, things like that. One of the cards is if you choose to do that trick and when you do a trick, you turn it around, no one else can do it for the rest of the round. Um, 
For each dog paw you have, you can manipulate a die on somebody's buried area by no. by one per bone. So oh. if Dan if Dan's sitting there on on six bones and I've got two paws, I can go, well, Dan, move your die up two, and now you bust. Like oh, it just bust you on purpose, which I reckon so they 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 put some some cards in there that can give some good interaction like that, which yeah, I think is really cool. Gone it. Pardon? <laughs> it's a dog gone it. Get dog gone it. Um. And one of the other interesting uh, little actions you can, or choices you have in the game is if you have, you know, one, two, or three dogs uh, that you're trying to currently score that haven't flipped over yet because you've scored them, if you manage to fill in all the spots on all the dogs during your turn, you get to score them all automatically. And when you score dogs, you draw that many dogs again as long as you don't exceed six in total. Um, or if I've got, you know, four dogs out and two of them have been completed and the other two are getting close, instead of doing a trick, I can then score my dogs and then skip actually doing a trick giving me more opportunities to roll more dice so that's where it becomes really pushy luck because oh i've only got one die i need to do i don't want to spend my whole turn you know scoring the two dogs i want to score all three i'm just going to roll another die and see how i go and that's why i don't win this game um <laughs> but it's it's just a really cute game and it did for me exactly what I wanted to do. I, I went over to a friend's house for dinner last night. Um, and once in a while, we've gone over and I've taken a couple games and we get chatting and they're not really interested. I'm like, hey, guys, I've got a, like a 15-minute game and it's about dogs, putting spots on dogs. Like, oh, yeah, let's go. You know what I mean? Like, it was my good lead-in because who doesn't love dogs? And if you don't Yeah, love that's dogs, right. What's wrong with you? Um, but like... Uh, it was just a really good lead in to get these people to play a game when they weren't normally play games. And it let me do my favorite thing at the end of the game. Was that what you expected? No, I expected that. They always expect Dungeons and Dragons. I don't know why, <laughs> but they, they wanted to go again and they wanted to go again. And we started bringing out some of the different cards and nice. some of the different sort of things you can do, but it's just such a fun game. You're constantly busting and losing all your dice or trying to play it safe, which is boring. But um, Spots, it's a really, really fun game. I've wanted it for a long time. I saw it at PAX in the library. I borrowed it. We learned it in 10 minutes, played it, and then I was hunting a copy straight after that. Um, if you don't have it yet, guys, grab this game. It's just such a fun little filler in between games, something nice and fun to start your night with. Or once again, a really, really good option to drag more people into the board gaming hobby, I think, and show them what board games can be. That the theme, like, I think it, I think it just shows so many things that, that push your luck mechanics fun, um tough choices and just um that theme and board games have this new combination that i don't think people who don't play board games can really see usually so you know just whole filling up your spots and your dogs you know oh i get what we're doing here and they they got right into it so yeah spots awesome little game and uh that's my sizzle awesome stuff yeah i played it a couple of times and i've really enjoyed it it's so simple and so fun yeah it's a great game all right, so that just leaves me for my sizzle. Um, I think I'll talk about the game that I lost count of how many times I was teaching at PAX that I did get to play before PAX. <laughs> and that's the hot new Stonemaier game, and that is Apiary or Apiary. Depends how you want to pronounce it. It's Space Bees. <laughs> and uh, I've been, look, I've enjoyed many of the Stonemaier games over the time I've been involved in the hobby. But I don't own any of them. I haven't loved them enough to buy them. This might be the one that breaks Ooh. the mold. I think I want my own copy of this. So in Apiary, it's a simple worker placement game. You start with a few workers and you have a hive, which is all these hexes, that, you know, like a, like a beehive, all these hexes that sort of sprawl out on uh, across the galaxy. You're building a, a galactic hive. And... On your turn, you've got two choices. You can either place a worker or you can recall your workers. That's that's the the uh, that's the decision you've got to make first. If you want to place a worker, then you have to decide which of the six uh, actions you want to take. And the cool thing about this game that is so different from other worker placement games is in, I'm sure we're all familiar with this, someone goes and puts a worker on a spot and blocks you out and you just want to absolutely rail on them <laughs> and uh in this game you can't block people you actually bump them out of their spot and it's done in such a clever way because when you bump people's workers out of the spots that you want to take you actually increase the strength of their worker 
And the strength of your workers de determines how much stuff you can do on those actions. So to give you a brief idea of kind of what you're doing, I won't go through and teach the whole game, but uh, you've got an action that allows you to get uh, any excess workers into your active pool and also to expand your hive so you can build more stuff. There's an exploration action where there's this really cool queen bee ship that moves around the galaxy discovering planets. And when you do that, you'll give you resources. So that's a, a nice way to get resources. And for that explore action, as well as a couple other ones I'll mention soon, you you get to move the work, the queen bee ship the number of space is equal to the strength of your worker, but it actually has two spots and you'll add your opponent's strength to that action as well. So you've got some interesting decisions sometimes when there's multiple spots, what you put down, other people are going to be able to benefit off of on subsequent turns, which I really, really enjoyed about this game. Uh, you've got uh, an action, I can't quite remember the name of it, but it essentially allows you to buy tiles that go into your hive. And you've got tiles that can, three types of tiles. You've got farm tiles, which give you storage cells to store your resources. You've got, um, I can't remember the names of them, but you've got blue and pink ones. The blue ones give you ongoing powers for the whole game, and the pink ones give you one-off benefits. And so there's lots of powers just in those tiles alone that you're trying to synergize together to get more out of the actions that you take throughout the game. Um, you've also got a conversion action, allows you convert resources. And then you've also got uh, an action that allows you to draw cards. Those seed cards are like one-off powers you can play, or they can be end game goals if you tuck them under your board, which are really, really cool. And then you've also got a location in the middle, which is to get uh, more tiles to build, but they're end game scoring tiles. And they're really hard to get because they require honey, which is the hardest resource to get in the game. It's very, very simple. Like I've given a brief overview of most of the actions in the game. But I've the thing I've really enjoyed about playing this is you start with a unique... Um, faction tile that has its own ability and then you have matched that with a unique hive mat which has different configurations and different powers as you cover them up you get those benefits and then you've got end game scoring tiles which you only use a small amount of the all the available ones in the box and then the tiles stacks for the the basic ones you can buy are massive there's so much replayability in this game it's so much variety it's really quite impressive just seeing what's available starts to skew you in different directions and maybe the power you get starts to change what you want to do. It's so cleverly done. I've been able to, you know, nail the teach down because I've done it so many times mm. in under 10 minutes for a game that probably takes an hour and a half to play or so. It's a very, very mid-weight game. It's not overly complex, but provides a lot of really interesting interactions that I really enjoyed. And at first, when I played the game, I wasn't so sure about the bumping and you get to increase the, the strength of um, the the workers for your opponents. And I was like, oh, like, it's nice, but, you know, it's not that interesting. But the more I thought about it is because when you recall your workers, you get to activate farm tiles. And for each one you recall, you get to get income and they'll have little incomes at the top of these tiles. So, when you actually bump someone, yes, you're going to give them strength, but you're also denying them income. And when I started to, that started to click with me, I was like, oh, okay, there, it, there is a trade-off. It's not all good for your opponent for getting mm. bumped off. They, they lose access to have some resources collected from farms. I, I think it's really, really clever. The artwork is gorgeous. It looks stunning on the table, but I... I just want to keep playing this game because, like I said, there's so many different scoring tiles. There's new combinations of factions and player boards that you're going to have all the time. And there's just a depth of tiles in, in instant powers and also ongoing effects that can really lead to some satisfying combos in the game. I got to play at PAX as well. I did the demo <clears throat> taught me by uh, Jono from my community. And... Um, yeah, I was really impressed. It's a really great little game. It um, it's you can see it ramps up a lot. So we were doing a demo, so we could only play like three or four turns. But 
you can see there's a lot of investment in the game to your future turns and future actions. And as you start seeing your worker bees level up and things like that, it was really, really cool. And you can start to sort of see, oh, okay, so in a few more turns, I'll be able to do this, 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 and this. And it sort of mixed a few different mechanisms as well. Like there was like a little like, um, I think at the bottom of the board, Jules, almost like a... Um, area control sort of area we yeah can take that's up right parts of it and yeah and a few different cool mechanisms mixed into it so i actually would really like i didn't buy a copy that day um because <clears throat> i was already in trouble for buying too many games <laughs> but uh i definitely do want to play this game in full because i think once you play a full game you're going to really see it shine and Absolutely. see all that hard work at the start pay off towards the end yeah the the bottom of the board that you mentioned there is the, the hibernation comb. Mm. So, when workers need to go beyond four strength, they've got really nice components in this game. Yeah. It's a little B ship and you roll it over to increase its strength. When it needs to go beyond four, it goes into hibernation. You lose the worker and you need to go to, to that location to get new workers back again. But you place a little token down and you'll get a benefit. But the... The uh, hibernation comb area has little subsections and whoever has the most hibernation tokens in there will get victory points. And the game ends when someone puts all their hibernation tokens out or it just gets filled up by all the players. And there's some interesting, another p interesting nuance in the game I'll mention. Um, and that is when a worker is bumped, as I said, you can increase its worker strength by putting it back in the active pool, or you can put it in the landing area where it doesn't increase its strength. Now, the example I kept giving to people when I was teaching it was, say you had a strength four worker on the board and someone bumped it off. Well, if it increases, it's going to go into hibernation, which is not bad because you'll get to put a token down and get a, a benefit. It might be a, a honey or a wax, or you can refresh one of the markets. There's a whole range of things. But if you decide to put it back into your landing area instead of your active pool and keep it the same strength, it means you've got a strength four worker to use again when you recall. And then you can put it at, at out again and get strength four on the actions. The benefit of that is every action on the board has an additional bonus if you played a strength four worker. And they're really quite powerful yeah. uh, if you time it right. So there's some interesting timing that is there to consider. You might bump someone's strength four worker and they might not actually want it to, to go into hibernation because it advances the end game. So they might not be ready for that. It's some very clever timing. I've been very, very impressed with this one and I can't wait to play it again. That's uh, Apiary. Very cool. Beautiful. All righty. That's a lot of games <laughs> we talked about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I might mention some announcements and news before we launch into our question of the pod. First of all, as we mentioned, PAX has happened. There was a special PAX episode we launched during the week. So, in case anyone missed it, uh, go check that out. It's episode 264. Looking ahead, though, we also have South by Southwest happening this week. And there's a lot of events going on. I'd probably encourage people to go to the website or download the app and search Board Game Barbecue because then you'll see the events that we're involved with. We're doing a couple of things, officially and unofficially. Officially, there will be a live podcast that we're going to be recording and also a trivia night uh, that we're going to do that Dan has been putting together. So, I'm very, very excited for that. But yeah, if you're in Sydney or have planned to come to Sydney for South by Southwest, um, hit us up and we'll get together and play some games. On the other events front, we've also got the Melbourne Game Day coming up on the 4th of November. The tickets are on sale for that right now. So head on over to Eventbrite and grab those tickets before they're gone. And also the Brisbane Game Day on New Year's Eve Eve is on sale now as well for tickets. So there's going to be, we're going to go out with a bang for the year on that one. We've got uh, Games Australia and Let's Play Games uh, doing a bit of sponsorship for that event. So we'll have a bit more giveaways than usual, which will be nice and fun. If you're looking for a new board game, you need to check out adventgames.com.au. They have a great range of games, including pre-orders and hot new games. Anything you could be looking for will be there at Advent. Dean provides excellent customer service that is second to none and he's always keen to support the Australian board game community through events, game days, and even through sponsoring a podcast. So head over to adventgames.com.au today. That's adventgames.com.au. 
So, last week's question of the pod was a great one. I'm keen to hear your guys' answers and also read off some of the community answers. It was, which game you wish you had when you were younger? Now, some people obviously grew up playing games and have fond memories of old games like Hero Quest and, and, or even just playing chess and Scrabble. I have fond memories playing that with family. But do you guys have any, any games that you have now but you wish you had when you were younger? Zombicide, next. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been Probably so good, good as a kid, man. That would have been so cool as a kid, you know, like I would have scratched that video game itch. Um, but also thinking about the question, a lot of my dexterity games I would have loved to have as a yeah. kid as well, like my roof raff and hamster roll and things like that, I think would have been really, really cool um, when I was a lot younger. I think I, would have, like, I think I liked Django growing up. So, you know, having Django on steroids would have been awesome. Yeah. The one I was thinking of uh, is... Throughout high school, I played a lot of card games with mates and I would have loved Scout. I reckon mm. that would have just been a, a massive hit if I'd had that when I was uh, in high school. That like every lunchtime was just card games, just you know, all kind it, things you can play with a normal deck of cards. Mm. We tried all sorts of things, but Scout would have been a massive hit, I reckon. Mm. Um, for me and and it's funny because I've always been interested in Dungeons and Dragons, but the first time I ever played it was when Mitch ran a campaign a couple of years ago with the group of us. So I was always fascinated by it, but I didn't have any friends who played it. I didn't know how to get in touch with anyone who played it. Obviously, I knew I knew of it from 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 movies and from popular culture, but just I didn't have any access to it. So because the, there was no internet, um, and mm. we're talking the eighties. All right, let's. <laughs> right, right. 1980s, not yes. 1880s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't know anyone who who played Dungeons and Dragons or even knew how to run a camp- campaign or anything like that. So I would have loved to have mm. been fully immersed in Dungeons and Dragons back when I was a kid, back when I was a teenager. Yeah, um, that would have been cool. Yeah, and, I, and I'm I'm kind of stealing it because I know there was a, there was an answer from our Discord that was a similar thing, but yeah, that really resonated with me. Yeah, I'll call out another one: exploding kittens. Like, if I had that when I was a kid, I reckon that would have just been played all the time. Because, mm-hmm. you know, I, I grew up playing Risk and Monopoly and, and Scrabble and chess and all those classics. And I enjoyed playing them, but I didn't play them often because sometimes I just didn't feel like it or, or I didn't have the friends around that I, I wanted to play Risk with or whatever. But a game like Exploding Kittens, I reckon, would just gone off all the time with my siblings. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I used to play games with my brother, but I reckon something like Dice Throne, we would have played. Up oh, games. yeah. Yeah. Um, rather than just playing like, yeah, yeah we, we played Scotland Yard and Cluedo and some of those games, but they're designed for four players. They're not really designed for two players. There weren't many mm. two-player games around. Something like Dice Throne would have been perfect for me and my brother when we were growing up. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's hear from some of the community. Um, I'll just We had some short answers that I'll just read off on Instagram. Biome Board Games at Quacks of Quedlinburg. Mm. Absolutely. That, that would have been a massive hit, I reckon, when I was younger. Uh, also, Mr. and Mrs. Meeple said Marvel Champions. I yeah. haven't played a lot of Marvel. I haven't played Marvel Champions yet, so I guess I'll, you guys have a lot. You haven't? No, I haven't played it yet. Oh. It's have great. I started you on an oath? Was there an oath where I was supposed to teach you that and you were going to teach me brass? Is that Yeah, right? there was something like that. Look, we don't need to dig that one yeah. up. But uh, anyway. <laughs> Long buried broken oaths. Yeah, that's it. I, I do want to try it. I think it was I think it was part of an oath and uh, that I wanted to play everyone in the crew's number one game from the previous mm. year that we did our top 10s. I still want to do that. Absolutely. Like, I need to experience these games. So, anyway. Mm. Uh, disc- we had some Discord responses. Dan, do you want to read those off? Yeah. So, the one, the one that resonated with me, Jace said Gloomhaven or Frosthaven, as he would have more likely had the time and a consistent group to actually play through the full campaign. Mm. He's picturing the scene from E.T. when the older brother is playing D&D with his friends. So, yeah, 100% agree. Draven said when he was younger, he played a lot of trick-taking games, a lot of trick-taking games, multiple (laughs) hands of 500 every night with school friends. He thinks he would have been delighted to have some of the modern twists like The Crew, Cat in the Box, Shaden Fraud, some of those um, sort of trick-takers. And Chris on Discord said, I think for me it's not really a single game I wish was around when I was a 
child or a teenager, but a mechanic and a genre. I grew up with two younger brothers, and we weren't allowed consoles and video games apart from little amount of time on the computer each week. But we did have and played a lot of games, Monopoly, Battle Dome, Myth, Game of Life, Headache, Crossbows and Catapults. Ah, Crossbows and Catapults. Um, but... <laughs> All our time, our all-time favorite was Hero Quest, but being one versus many, it threw the balance out a bit, and there was always fights over who was the over, who the overlord was going to be, <laughs> yes. who got which character. I would have loved the full co-op dungeon crawl slash campaign adventure games. My brothers and I would have been all over Gloomhaven, Mansions of Ma- Mansions of Madness, Second Edition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that genre of game is what I really wished could have existed back then. Uh, that's a great solid answer. Great answer. Yeah. Very good. Well, as I mentioned at the top of the podcast, um, this is Mike's last episode. And like we did with Sarah, not, it doesn't feel like that long ago. Uh, we're going to throw to the community and, and ask people what your favorite episode and or sizz- your favorite Mike episode and or sizzle. I'll, I'll just I'll answer this question uh, here. And I think one of my favorite episodes that uh, I remember Mike being on was when we had uh, Nikki and Lincoln from Game mm-hmm. Night on. And just the enthusiasm and, and uh, the good times he's he's had then and since with those guys. Yeah. It was a really, really great episode. Uh, we spent really an hour and a half that. chatting after, afterwards, I think. Yeah, so that's right, you half, did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just kept talking with them. So that, that was yeah, a really was, good one. They reciprocated and you went on their show as well. On the, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I did a live stream with them when I was in LA. Planet, was it Planet Unknown? I taught them Planet Unknown on the yeah. live stream. Yeah. yeah. So no, that, anyone hasn't checked that out, go and check out um, Game Night because Mike's on it. Yeah, that's it. And that I don't was... think I, I didn't actually went up as a proper episode. It was like a live stream that was on like uh, oh, Twitch, I think, and then disappeared oh, eventually. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's sad. Oh, I must yeah. be watching it live then. I recorded it. I it's fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that the episode I was mentioning was back at episode one hundred and one. That's oh, wow. quite some time wow. ago. I don't. I don't have a specific episode in mind, but I, most of my favorite sizzle are the ones that, and most of them have got German names. But all of the yes. dirty <laughs> games that Mike sort of just digs out of nowhere, and he goes, "Oh, my sizzle! This I have to tell you about this." And just these, like, I don't. No one. No one really covers dexterity games like Mike has with his enthusiasm. But all the different ones, they're all German. I can't pronounce any of them. Most of them he can't pronounce either. But <laughs> it's just, just these, these completely just. Batshit crazy games that he's he, that he's brought to our attention and the attention of the community. I think it's just yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, I think of those dexterities. Um, oh, what's the one uh, that is the ship that sways around? Riff raff, riff raff. Riff raff. Riff raff. Yeah, yeah, that's got to be my favorite. That one's mental. I took that to packs and I just set it up with like I wanted to meet new people, so I just set it up with looking for player sign and I sat there just swinging the ships. So people were like, oh, what the hell's that? <laughs> nice. Got a table of people. Yeah. yeah, would have been you would have been by yourself for about five seconds. Yeah, max. <laughs> <I reckon. laughs> yeah. Mike, Thanks do you have any that. favorite episodes <clears throat> or, or or fond sizzles that you had? Oh look, sizzles! They're all they're all sizzling. They're they're yeah, all fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, my favorite episodes I listed. I wrote a couple of notes, but um, my favorite ones. Like I'm a big fanboy, and when we started being able to like interview some of the other like um, internet personalities, they're the ones I really got giddy about. Mm-hmm. Um, so like you mentioned before, um, uh, Lincoln and Nikki from Game Night was absolutely exciting, and I just was buzzing for days about that one. Um, oh, I thought I wrote some notes. Where are they? Um. Like our family plays games was awesome. Giving you know, uh, revving up Mitch. Uh, sorry, Mitch. Uh, Mick. Uh, you know when we interviewed Quackalope, Devon, Thinker Theme. Uh, uh, Tom Vassal was a big one. You know, just mm-hmm. such a big personality to have a chat with him and have him give me crap about the games behind me. Yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> Those things are really cool. Paul Grogan. You know, it's, it's like I sit here, sort of saying all these names, and it's it's surreal that. You know, doing the barbecue gave me an opportunity to talk to all of these people I watched for a long time or maybe discover some people that I hadn't known about before. Um, but those episodes, like, stick with me a lot, you know, just because, you know, you feel like you're on the show with them almost, you know. Like, you sit there, you know, researching games and getting opinions for so long and then you get to actually have a chat to them and ask them questions and join in that banter. Those episodes were, were, were really special to me. Yeah, good stuff. Mm. Well, um, it's been a kind of hectic few weeks with PAX and some other things going on with the Board Game Barbecue crew, but we do have some some messages, some thank yous and, and things to share with you, Mike. So, uh, we're going to cut to that now and uh, play those to you. Thank you for being a friend. Yeah, mate, um... 
look, I have recently gone to the hobby about a year ago, uh, based in Melbourne. I have sort of fallen hard and quick. I, uh, I played a couple games with the next partner. I used to have a game of Munchkin that I had lying around for a long time and I uh, never actually knew how to play. And then when I met someone that uh, could teach me, I went, I said, oh, this is, this is a board game? I didn't know board games were like this. And then I quickly played uh, a few other games and said, no, nope, I need to start buying some of these to start playing myself. I found a local board game group that I joined. Uh, and since then, I've just kept buying and playing more games. Hey, Mike, Dan here. I don't think there's been anyone on the podcast who's ever been as passionate for this hobby and for the community as you, mate. Um, so I hope whatever you go on to do, you don't lose, lose that fire. Um, the hobby would be certainly uh, much worse off if you ever lose that passion. So whatever you do, um, hopefully you, you, you keep up that passion and keep, keep loving board games especially your party games and your dexterity games, your polyomino games and all the games with poop. Uh, those, those games need someone to champion champion the poop games. So, yeah, you're the, you're the man. When you hear poop, you think Mike. Poo- oh, pooples. Pooples is just magic, isn't it? Just rolls off the tongue. <laughs> hey, Mike, this is Dev. Um, I'm very sorry to see you leave, mate. We are going to miss you. I'm going to miss you. Your passion and your enthusiasm for board games and for the industry as a whole uh, has been contagious. It was a joy to be able to record a lot of episodes with you and play a few games together as well. You've always been a positive force in in the hobby and I hope you keep doing that uh, through your game groups and other means. Your enthusiasm is very contagious and uh, I always found it very difficult not to get carried away when when talking with you about the games that you play, even though our, our tastes are uh, quite different. Um, I remember one episode where we were talking about two very different things. I think I spoke about us as Vanguard and you spoke about Marvel Zombies and when I finished, he said, you know, that was a very good description, Dev, and whatever else for the game. And when you finished talking about Marvel Zombies, I was like, this sounds so much fun. I won't play this, even though it's not my type of game. And I think that is just you. That is, you know, your your personality. You're so passionate about board games and for just having fun with people. And you, you see board games as a, a way to have a lot of fun. And I think that translates to to the types of games you play and the way you approach them and that's always been an absolute joy to see i'm going to miss that and yeah i i hope that you keep in touch and um we see you around the community and um, maybe we can we can finally play that game of too many bones together at some point good luck brother hi mike it's dana banana here so this is my first time recording with you on the same podcast but sadly it's for your farewell um now i have to admit you know that mitch is my number one he makes me speechless you know that but i can honestly say that you're definitely my number two out of out of the out of all nine you're my number two and i'm going to be disappointed Um, to see you leave the podcast. I remember you were always um, so enthusiastic and full of energy and I know I've got big shoes to fill coming into the the podcast. So I just wanted to wish you all the best for the future and I hope to see you at a gaming table sometime soon. Hey Mike, it's Connor here, or as you dub me, Condog. Um, always just enjoyed your warmth on the podcast uh, and your enthusiasm for games. I think that's something that's been talked about by everyone and, and the feedback that you're always getting. I also really um, appreciated and, and cared for how you championed mental health and how you how board games help your mental health. Um, that resonated pretty highly with me, uh, you know, because it's something that I. Um, I think lots of people sort of struggle with so thank you for that I've got lots of great memories of, of, of you and, and the podcast 
Uh, one in particular is uh, when a two minute or five minute dungeon usurped Nemo's War uh, in the board game Barbecue Bracket, the fabled board game Barbecue Bracket. That was one of the all time upsets, I think. Um, but I, I think my best memories of you are, are playing those games like um, you know, Mafia de Cuba and how you ran it. And, and I know it's been talked about before, but how you just gave us such a great sense of community. Um, and that's just hits the nail on the head. Um, I'll also never forget how my dear mum came to the Melbourne Game Day and she sort of was standing around and going for a look and without you know, a blink of an eye or, or batting an eyelid, you, you, you said, hey, bring her over and we can play a game together. And um, you played um, um, Riff, Riff Raff, I think it was, the Wobbly Ship game. So again, thank you. Thank you for everything you've done for us. I mean, you were such a crucial part of the community. Um, I hope you go on to bigger and better things. Uh, and uh, just really looking forward to catch up and catching up with you whenever you come to a Melbourne Game Day or any of um, the festivals that we have. So best of luck and uh, hey, look, just uh, don't be a stranger and I'll see you around. So this last week, I think my sizzling game has actually been Space Base. Abomination, the heir of Frankenstein. It's time to bring out some Zombicide. Well, my sizzling game is actually my oath, um, which was Marvel United. Baron Park. I'm going to choose this week for my sizzling game, a game called Above and Below. Well, I've uh, I've had my on a game for a little while now, and I sort of dug around till I found it to buy, and uh, since I purchased it, I've been doing lots of research, uh, so I can get it to the table, and that game is Clank. One of the games that caught my eye when I was buying a bunch was um, Smash Up. Bringing back an oldie but a goodie at the moment, I finally pulled out Everdell to the table. I found a game that used to be an app I used to like on my phone that I, I played quite a bit, and I saw they bought it out as a game a little while ago, so I thought I'd give it a try, and that is Plague Inc. I, it never really attracted me, but when I played it, it sort of got the, the brain going, and I really enjoyed it, and that was Carcassonne. Well, I recently uh, I recently found my love for polyamino style games um, after playing Baron Park and things like that. So I recently got a Kickstarter copy of Isle of Cats. A game that we did get started was Pandemic Legacy Season 1. A game that I've enjoyed recently in the past and with the board game barbecue crew in the past as well. That's Fantasy Realms. Now, how many sizzling games are we allowed to have again? It's Cat Lady. There's one that I played, look, maybe a couple of weeks ago now, but it's been stuck in my head ever since I played it. When um, it got introduced to me, I didn't think too much before I jumped in. Uh, this is Aquatica. My sizzling game today is a game I played about a week and a half ago. I went to a new board game group that I haven't been to before and met a gentleman and I saw it in his bag. I said, I've wanted to play Calico for a while now. I fell in love. And that's Raptor. I don't mind a good old, uh, old, old school in inverted commas, um, Euro. And I've been bugging my housemate for ages to teach me Orient, Orleans, whatever you want to call it, that one. And my housemate came out and said, oh, I want to play this game called Legacy, uh, the Testament of Duke de Creasy. So I've been getting to the table. Let's see if I get this right in the first go. Super skill pinball 4 k And I fell in love. And I have a feeling that I'm a bit late to the party. I reckon a lot of people have probably played this small little game. Um, Hanabi. It's such an awesome puzzle. I think this thing can take off if people really look at it. And it's called Juicy Fruits. I'm going to sizzle a game that I got taught last week. So I have only played it once. It's been a busy, busy week. And I haven't had a chance to play too many new games lately. But this game surprised me. I'd I've heard the name thrown around a little bit, and I didn't know what to expect. But it was on my hit the table. The game is Almanac: The Dragon Road. So I'll start with a little game called Red Seven. The game I've been playing a bunch is one of your favorites, Marvel Champions. I do love some fantasy a bit more, and I found out there's something called Hero Realms, and I finally ordered it, and that is Cubitos. Okay, everybody, switch up your lights and get ready for the night cage. Terraforming Mars, Ares Expedition. So the game is Flick of Faith. I would like to sizzle Cryo. I heard Adrian talk about this game a while ago, and it's always interested me, and he raved about it, and being a game he normally wouldn't like, it really raised my eyebrows. Um, and that game is Men at Work, the dexterity game. But for me, the sizzling game for me this week... 
I have to go back to my previous oath because I've just been diving deeper into it, and that's Mystic Veil. The one I want to sort of concentrate on today, and the one that's been my sizzling game, it's Meeples and Monsters. But the main game I want to highlight today, the game that I've been chasing since I played it and no one's willing to sell it to me, is <laughs> Wonderland's War. Um, my main game I think I've been enjoying lately is I played a second round of In the Hall of the Mountain King, uh -huh, which yes. was awesome. My sizzling game, uh, oh, it's pretty close to a coin game, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> no, in case it's, it's far from. Um, I want to talk about Creature Comforts. My main game that I've been playing, though, and that got my attention this week, was I finally played Planet Unknown, Blood on the Clock Tower. And the game is a little game called Pictures. I'll wrap up the sizzles with a little sizzle of mine. It's another <laughs> one that I brought back. Uh, it's Terracotta Army. <laughs> but my sizzle game today is going to be another little game I picked up uh, from AEG. It's called That Old Wallpaper. Look, it's not going to be a surprise for anybody what my sizzle is. <laughs> but listen, you all saw it coming because yeah. I promised to play the newest in the Zombicide series, Undead or Alive. Marvel Zombies hit the shores of Australia in a game called Tyrants of the Underdark. Um, and it's a game that I had a lot of buzz about a little while ago, and I finally got a copy. I actually bought it off Mr. Mitch himself. Um, it's Bullet Heart, about Pulsar 2849. <gasps> it's a little tile laying game called Voluspa. And a friend of mine recently asked, ah, oh, have you played Lost Cities? My sizzle, though, was another game I'd never heard of, and someone pulled it out, called Balratty. My sizzle won't go for too long because it's a legacy game that I just finished with my friends. And the game is My City. Sizzling for me is uh, a game that's had a lot of buzz a little while ago and I finally got my hands on it. I pre-ordered it with our good friends over at Advent Games. I got myself a copy of Earth. My sizzling game is a quick, small game that just came out of Kickstarter. I'm kicking myself that I didn't back it because I was eyeing it up at the time. It's a little tile placement game called Junk Drawer. Hi Mike, thank you for teaching me how to beatbox. <laughs> I know you can't see that, but he just dropped an invisible mic and walked off and said, done. I remember setting my alarm for 1am so I could get up and record an episode with Tom Vassell with Mike and when I logged onto the computer I was so bleary eyed, I, I was wrecked. The first thing I see is Mike there just giddy as a schoolboy, he could not wait to talk to, to Tom Vassell. I know Tom Vassell was one of your idols and I know that interview meant a lot to you so I, I'm really happy that, um, that this podcast gave you the opportunity to, to chat to Tom. Can I ask Tom? Um, you mentioned your top ten lists, which I think you're quite, you know, known for from the from the Dice Tower. I've recently started doing top tens and top one hundreds for the podcast, which I've never done before, and I'm still quite new to the hobby. For yourself, you said you find them quite fun. Is it a long process for you, or like, are you at a point now that you can really quickly snap together a top ten because you sort of know what you like? Do you have like a certain process you follow? It all depends on the list itself. I I just rate things mm. automatically. It drives my kids crazy. I'd be like, we just went to the amusement park. <laughs> what were your 10 favorite rides in order? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, when they first get into the hobby, is like, it's all amazing. This is amazing. This is amazing. You think that about every <laughs> game. And <laughs> I think we're guilty of that as well. <laughs> that's still, that's still well I know me. it is because I can. We're, we're, we're recording this video and I see both the collections behind you. You guys, I'm not, I'm not saying they're, <laughs> I'm not saying they're bad games, although I, there's clearly a few bad games in the shelves behind you. Um, but <laughs> he's, he's referring to you, Mike, not me. He is. I'm sure he is. <laughs> That's great. Uh, hey, you Mike. Lauren here. I remember meeting you at the first Sydney game day. You had a larger than life personality. You went out of your way to make sure that the day wasn't just fun for everyone, but that the community was a place that was welcoming. You had such a keen eye and were so well attuned to how people might feel and how people might be feel trepidatious or anxious to approach kind of large social, social settings like these game days. And you just made everyone feel welcome, made everyone feel like they had a place at the table. And you've been such a great champion, as Connor said, for mental health 
in the community. It's something I'm really passionate about myself. I work in that space and I really hope you just continue to do such great work in bringing people into a hobby that can be great for them socially, help their well-being, and you've just been such a bright star in this community, a champion for fun games, for silly games that don't always get talked about or valued like they should be because that's what they really do, right? They just bring people together. So yeah, thanks for everything, Mike. Hey, Mike. Um, there's so many things I could say about you know, enjoying this time on the podcast with you, but Honestly, just thank you for you know sharing your enthusiasm and love for the hobby. As many people have said before and probably will continue to say, your enthusiasm has been infectious. And I've definitely felt that when I was living in Victoria, um, you invited me around to your place many, many times. And I'll always cherish those memories of uh, all the many games we've played together and that we'll still get to play and of course we'll get to see each other at game days and things like that but it's it's been really really enjoyable um, seeing your growth over the, the life of the podcast that you've been a part of it and how you've talked about your taste refining and I feel like I've gone through that process too I think uh, one of my favorite memories of playing with you would be when you taught me Tart to the Underdark it's a fantastic game. I really thoroughly enjoyed that one. And uh, also playing Mafia de Cuba with you, just really getting into the character of the Don. It's, you know, those are some special memories and they'll never go away. And so just thank you. Thank you for everything you've done for the board game barbecue and everything you will do for the hobby in the future. You know, this is, as we've probably said before, it's, it's uh, not uh, a goodbye forever, but we'll see you later for sure. So thanks, Mike. Um, hope to see you at the table again soon. All right. Uh, that was a bit of a fun trip down memory lane, hearing all those sizzles again. Um, yeah, really I definitely do a long too, lead man. into them, don't I? I, do, I, like, yeah. I take my time to say the game. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Some of the lead ups longer than the game itself. <laughs> Everyone at home can play their guess this. Guess what game is Mike? Ref- what game Mike's referring to? <laughs> There's some absolute crap bangers in there. Uh, yeah. yeah, for sure. Uh, that would be. I'm excited to hear what the community has to say about uh, this week's question. Uh, what is your favorite Mike episode and or sizzle? So, you know. All the usual places, people. Yeah, it's Facebook, Discord, Twitter, and Instagram. <coughs> share share your thoughts and and say thank you, like we've done just now, um, to Mike for everything he's done for us. And as, as I said, he will do in the future for the hobby. I don't think he's going anywhere. <laughs> I'll still be here. Uh, thank you, thank you, guys, so much. That was really awesome to listen to, and thank you for the kind words from everyone. That was that was really special. Thank you so much. Uh, you're most welcome. <clears throat> All right. Well, with with that, we'll move into the last segment, which is uh, Swear an Oath. All right. Just before we cap off with the Swear an Oath, we'll do our little community shout out. So, thank you to our wonderful patrons for supporting us. And a special thank you this week to the following. I hope we get all the names right. I apologize if I don't. Uh, it's Tom Muddy, Dana Devison, Harry... Uh, Manassian and Jeff Sherpless. So thank you to all of you and all the rest of our wonderful patron supporters for keeping us going through all the the shows we've been doing. Uh, If you want to support the podcast in any other ways, of course, you can join the Facebook community. You can join our Discord community and share your thoughts and feelings about games. We always love interacting and talking with people there. You can leave us a star rating on Spotify or review on Apple Podcasts. All of those things help us greatly. And honestly, we just love reading those reviews. I don't know if we've had any new five-star ones, have we, Dan? Not for a little while? No. No. No, well, they always brighten up our day. So if you haven't done one yet, now's a good time to do it. So pull over in the car or stop your work, whatever you're doing, whip out that Apple podcast and write a review. That would be awesome for us. Um, Of course, coming to the game days is a massive way to support as well. All the links to all the things that we do will be in the show notes. All right. So I might kick us off with the swear and oath because 
I unfortunately have not had success for this past uh, in between episodes period. Oh, what a it, disgrace! It is a, well. I look. Okay, here's the story. <laughs> So I I mentioned that I was going to PAX and I was going to be able to pick up a Kickstarter that I ordered. I was very excited for and that's Primordial Secrets. I picked up the game, I brought it back, really excited, unpacked it, and unfortunately, it's a it's a card game. Really sadly, I know it's an indie Kickstarter, and so you know, I don't know if the production uh, they couldn't pay for the best production in the world or whatnot, but some of the cards were. Uh, not cut right. So they were actually sliced in deeper than oh, they're supposed no. to be. Yeah. So the game wasn't actually playable. Um, so I was really disappointed. I've contacted them. They're going to get some replacement cards for me. But I was uh, quite deflated actually when that happened, seeing those cards cut. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> they're just, it's not playable because, you know, I'd have to remove some cards and uh, or some of them were creased and bent from the machine cutting them. So that was a bit disappointing, but I am getting replacement cards. So that will get done ASAP because I'm very excited to play it. But until that gets resolved, uh, my new oath, although I didn't play any games at PAX, I did buy one game and that is a starter set for Netrunner. Oh. Yeah, so I've played this a couple of times. I've mentioned it on pods in you know the past few months so throughout this year, and I've got my own set of uh, the starter set for the the uh, community printed net, net runner, not the official Fantasy Flight one from uh, a long way back. So I want to play that. I want to play some net runner before I'm on the next podcast. So that's what I'm going to do. Are you prepared for the rabbit hole? I am, yes. Whoa, right I, I, I like I love to play as the corp. I think that's still my favorite way. Just setting up those traps and playing the mind games against the runner. But uh yeah, love the game to bits. So yeah. I'm gonna play some more of that. All Very right, cool. Dan. Tell me you've had some success this time. Well, it's such a such a shame that um Primordial Secrets is miscut, but at least you got your oath out of shrink because mine's still in shrink. <laughs> <laughs> When I said that was outrageous, I was um, <clears throat> I was being sarcastic. I have not fulfilled either of my oaths well, with packs and with episodes on the go. Aeon's End, Past and Future was my most recent oath. I haven't, haven't had a chance to get to it. Unbreakable Riffle was the oath before that. I don't think I've ever had a triple oath before. But oh, wow. I'm setting I'm a new precedent here. I'm staring the battle of a triple oath because on the podcast, what we do, we, we double down, so I'm tripling down. Um, Oof. But this one, I'm confident I can at least, I can at least, uh, it's another, another Kickstarter that arrived recently. So if nothing else, my oaths are actually helping me get some of these Kickstarters to the table. So you'll recall a long, long time ago, I sizzled Tim Fowers' game Fugitive. Well, there was a reprint of that recently, and he also accompanied that Kickstarter reprint with another game called Run. It's again, it's another two player asymmetric game, plays in about 20 minutes. And so I, Dan Harris, were to play Run the next time on the podcast it's 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 very similar from what i understand although um fugitive is quite linear uh this one is done on a map where it's almost like a bit of a hide and seek where you're trying to sort of outwit the um the dispatcher i think who's trying to find you and you're going to try and you can get some gadgets um as the runner and try and help sort of out outlast the the dispatcher that's trying to find you but yeah run is the game that i'm going to be playing as my new oath fantastic um mike your last oath. My last episode, but I'm the one that has to hold the crew together. Um, my last <laughs> yes. oath was to play The Witcher. And oh, I did. yeah. I played it twice, um, and I loved it. There's a caveat, though. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> both times I played it was a four-player game. The first time I took it to my local game night I run, and the venue I was using that night, we had to be out by 10, and we got very close to finishing, but mm. we couldn't finish it. Yeah. Um, we played it the next night, invited some friends over, hoping we'd go a bit longer. Um, started a little bit on the later side. Uh, we nearly finished it. We could have had one more round and the game would have been done, but some people had to head home, work the next day, things like that. So I haven't actually finished the game yet. Um, it's, it's a fantastic game. I think... <clears throat> If you're playing a four-player game and, God forbid, a five-player game, mm. you need to be ready for a bit of a long haul. Um, look, still figure out the game a little bit, which might have slowed it down slightly. Um, 
But the game has a lot of downtime and you need to be prepared for that. I think that's why three players will be probably the sweet spot for it. In the game, there's so much you can do. You're traversing a huge map. You're moving your Witcher around. Um, you're trying to learn new skills to up some different uh, tributes on your on your little player board in front of you. You're tracking down monsters. You're fighting other players. There's lots of things you can do, and you basically want to kill monsters and and win a fight against other players, which give you new abilities, um, and they give you a trophy. And I think you have to get to four trophies to win the game. Um, you can't battle the same Witcher twice. Uh, so I can't attack Jules twice, for example. If I beat him once, I can't attack him again. Um, so that means everyone has to sort of mix up a little bit and fight each other. Um, the things that make the game take a long, a long time, it's like a narrative game. So when you go to an area, you sort of travel on the map, do what you want to do. And then you got to choose, um, if you're not fighting a monster, <clears throat> you got to choose uh, one of two decks of cards to pick a card up and have someone read to you. So what the game tries to do, they try to include the other players around you a bit more. So I think it's always a player to your left. If you're if in the game, you can sort of play like a little quick gambling game. And if you're not playing against another player, you play against the game. And so the player to your left does that for you, keeps them involved. The player to your left has to read out the card to you if you choose an event because there's multiple choice in there, like what direction do you want to do? And they're really cool. Sometimes you might choose a path that gives you like a quest to go on. So you have to slide that quest card somewhere else, get a little token. Well, I have to get here to get the next part of my quest. And you sort of it gives you a bit of direction you want to do because you're trying to track down a monster or something along those lines. But there's lots of cards in there, so you don't really get the same one twice in the two, well, two times I played. Um, we played with the expansion the second time, which is really cool. It included some boats and some islands to travel to as well. It's, it's a great game, but when someone's gambling, fighting other players, killing monsters. There's other players do have a lot of downtime, uh, which look for me, I'm happy to fill on my phone and chit chat while we do it. You don't have to necessarily pay attention to what they're doing. Um, but if that bugs you in games, this might be a bit of a, bit of a no go, but I think three players means only one player is not being involved for a little while. So probably work a bit better. Um, I've seen some play throughs with two players that, that I think will work great as well, but two players is less people to fight. I don't know. I think I like more interaction, but once again, if you've got enough time to play three, four hours of it and you've got four or five players and everyone's into it, especially once you know the game, you can speed up the play a little bit. The card play is really cool. Sort of a bit of a deck builder. You sort of add a card to your deck every round and, there's a really cool combo way of playing out your cards. This card will let you activate this power on this card, and this card will let you activate the power on this card. You sort of lay out a hand, and they're really cool turns, and it's a really cool, um, really cool way of playing the game. So I really, really enjoyed it. Um, would love to play it again, but it's a game that, you're, okay, this is going to be a whole afternoon kind of game. Let's not start too late, and let's be careful about how many players we choose. But I've got a couple of expansions for it, so I'm looking at trying those. Oh, wow. um, but The Witcher was successful, and oh, yep. Yeah, Two thumbs up from me. It was really good. Um, my new oath is one I've already started. I think I announced in the community at the start of the month that I would like to break my previous record of how many plays I have in a month. Not how many games I've played, but how many plays of games. I've played the same game more than once. It counts. Um, and I'm tracking well so far. So my previous record was in January 2022, I think. And it was at 96 plays in a month. And I want to crack triple digits. <laughs> so with packs. And with a few game days with friends, I'm currently at 58 plays. Okay. And today yeah. is the 15th, so I'm Halfway tracking through. well. Um, at the end of the month, I'm actually going to, I think it's called The Big Weekend in Bendigo. It's a three-day gaming thing. So I'll be playing games for three days there as well. Um, I've got a few friends I've got to catch up. Some friends just got back from Japan. I'm going to be playing play, 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 Essen, sorry. And so I'm going to play a bunch of their games, some new cool games as well. So I'm pretty confident by the end of this month, I should have hit 100 plays, and if I do or not, I will announce it in our socials. Fantastic. Beautiful. Wow, I wish I could get 100 games played in a month. <laughs> <laughs> That's I was actually, the hope. I was looking I was looking through my BG stats earlier today because it's very rare I get to play a game with my partner, and I was looking at, you know, how many plays, plays I've had and she's had with me over the course of the years that I've been tracking it, and I think... I'm probably going to be lucky if I hit 300 plays in this entire year. Wow. Which maybe that's a reflection on I don't play as many small light games. I tend to go longer, heavier games. Yeah. But um, 
look, yeah, it's it's all fun. We all want more time to play more games. So it, it does help when yeah. you like mean you have a lot in like a lot of the little games as well. You can yeah. smash a bunch out. And I've been doing a lot of that lately, not just to get to my hundred, yeah. but I've got a lot of cool new little games that I've been wanting to play lately. So it's definitely helped. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but um before we finish up, if I can take a moment absolutely just to, to to talk to you guys. I um yep, this is my last episode today. It's a hard decision to make, but one I felt I had to. Um, I just want to say thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, a really, really big thank you to to the board game barbecue crew, to the amazing community. It's been a life changing experience. Um, start like you heard it in that little preview that Dan put together. And thanks again, Dan. That was awesome. Um, I I started this podcast a year into the hobby. You know, I was just buying games left, right, and center. Anytime someone was selling a batch of games, I'd, I'd try to grab them all and just see what I liked from it. I didn't know what the different sort of styles of games were really, um, which was really intimidating coming to this group because a lot of you were experienced gamers, but it's changed me as a gamer. It um, helped me grow. It, it exposed me to lots of different games. And, you know, it'd be great if you guys honed me into one kind of game, but you guys <laughs> got me loving all the kinds of games. So <laughs> that's what's uh, contributed to my over now 500 game collection, Oof, which, which wow. just keeps growing. Um, but, yeah, look, from the start, you guys have all been really welcoming um, and supportive and helped me grow this passion of mine. You give me opportunities I wouldn't have had before. I've traveled for board gaming. I've done a live podcast. I've talked to those really awesome designers and and um, other presenters, and none of it would have been possible without all of you. I've learned a lot from you all, and I'm going to be forever grateful for, for being on this journey with everyone. Um, it is really sad to go, and I know I'm going at a time that the barbecue is just going to keep climbing and soaring and achieving amazing things and i'm looking forward to seeing where everyone ends up and and how how big this thing really gets um and i'll definitely see you guys at you know different events and things and i'll i'm going to be volunteering at the next board game game uh, the next barbecue game day and i'll teach a couple games um but yeah i just want to say a really big heartfelt thank you to everyone um a lot of you have been really supportive of a lot of things i've gone through in the past as well and been a shoulder to talk to uh, i need to talk to and you listen keenly so i just want to say a really really big thank you and a big thanks to the community the community is just something that's fired me up this whole time it's been amazing especially being privileged enough to go to brisbane and sydney and meeting so many awesome people um yeah it's uh it's been amazing. So thank you to everyone that's sat at a table with me, that's stood around and spoke, you know, board games with me and about life stuff and everything. Just it's it's all meant a lot to me. And I just want to say a really big thank you. I'm going to miss this, but um, you guys will see me around. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, massive thank you to you, Mike. You know, obviously you're one of the original members of the podcast and, and helped shape to shape it to what it is today and you you have deserve massive credit as being a part of that um so thank you for everything you've done we'll definitely miss miss you having around in the capacity that you've been in but of course like you said we'll see you at the game table very very soon so mm. thanks again and, and i know there was there was a big outpouring of love on our socials when you announced a couple of weeks ago that you're going to be finishing up but i hope that anyone who didn't wasn't aware they reach out to you as well because on behalf of the community, um, I think you say you've been affected by all the games and all the community, but this community has certainly been affected by you and your your passion, your enthusiasm and all the different t- games that you've taught to all the different people, um, not just in Melbourne but other game days and, and overseas as well, and I hope that continues. So best of luck in everything that you do, Matt, and don't Thank be strange. All right. Well, I think on that sour, sweet and sour note, uh, we'll end this episode here. And uh, I, I, we look forward to talking to you, the community, again next week for episode 266. Until then, play lots of games. Bye for now. Oh, pooples. Pooples is just magic, isn't it? Just rolls off the tongue. <laughs>